grace, mercy, and peace be with you today. They are gifts from uh, God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Uh, it's good to be here. It uh, feels like it's been a little while. Uh, it's been a couple weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, we took 21 youth to the National Youth Gathering, and I saw Pastor uh, Daniel uh, share some of that with you as I watched online last week. And then this past week, I had the chance to go on our annual vacation to Camp Luther, and it was a great time to unplug and unwind to... Uh, I see my daughter Emily in action as a counselor, so uh, it's kind of an oddity to be gone a couple weeks like that. I'm very thankful you didn't change the locks to the door, so thank you very much. The key still works. So. But it is good to be here, and it, it is good to sometimes uh, just kind of unplug a little bit. I think we're all kind of on our devices a lot, and I watch TV a lot, and we kind of, we kind of find ourselves checking out to different things. Uh, there's a show that when I'm not being unplugged that I kind of watch every once in a while. Not a lot, but when it comes on, I can't find anything else. I don't know. Maybe some of you have ever seen this show right here. Anybody familiar with that show there? It's called Counting Cars. And uh, the, the real tough-looking guy in the middle there, they're all actually a lot tougher than me. But uh, Danny the Count, it's his custom shop where he takes, uh, he takes cars and he restores them. And he takes them from what they are to what he could make them to be. And actually, in the beginning of every one of his uh, promos to kind of start the, 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 the show, he says, this is Vegas, and some people bet with chips, but I bet with rides. And that's how he always starts with that, and they kind of talk about how they're going to restore the car. So anyways, you're wondering, well, why are we looking at counting cars? Because today, as we look at Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, we're going to consider the topic of confession. And I'd like to simplify this by making this, this topic of confession, as we see in Psalm 32 and 51, I'd like to distill it down to two images for you, okay? The first image is that of a poker hand. The second image is that of a fully restored classic car, okay? So poker cards is image one, and a restored car, image two. We'll get to each of those. Well, let's start off with with the poker hand. I learned to play poker at a young age. I know, and it's confession time, right? Um, I think my brother and I found some poker chips in my grandpa's closet in Florida, and we learned how to play poker. And uh, it was a great way to pass time. And I actually taught my kids how to play poker, not because uh, I'm trying to encourage them to gamble. In fact, when we played, we never even thought poker had anything to do with money. You just would divide the chips up and then whoever gets all the chips at the end wins, and then at the end of the game, you put the chips back. Uh, it wasn't until I was an adult, you kind of started to realize, oh, people put their real money in when they do this. But the idea of poker always is, is kind of interesting, because the thing about poker is, you have to hold some cards, right? And you have these cards that you hold when you play poker. These are a little bit uh, jumbo-sized ones for effect here. And, and when we hold these cards, if you've ever played poker, you kind of tend to keep them close to the vest, right? You kind of keep them close to your chest. And the reason you do that is that you don't want when somebody's going to the bathroom to look and, and see what kind of cards you got. It might, might influence how many chips they put in or how many they don't put in. And so you keep it kind of close to your chest like this. And the other thing about poker is when you get good cards or when you get bad cards, you don't want your face to reflect it, right? You don't want to be like... Oh my goodness, I'm really doing well this time. Or, oh man, I didn't want to get that card. You know, so your face, you need to have what they call a poker face. So that nobody can really read what's going on based on your face. A couple weeks ago, my pastor friend, Jake Allstate, reminded us in Minneapolis that sometimes life is like holding a bunch of cards. And we hold these cards... And we hold them close to our vest. We keep them close to our chest. And we, we have these things here, but we don't want other people to really see what's in our lives. And the other thing is, it's like poker. We don't want people to really know what we're holding based on our face. And so we've all gotten pretty good, pretty conditioned to keep a poker face. How things are really going in life. In fact, it might not just be so much a poker face, but it might be what you would call a Sunday face. Or maybe it would be what we'd call tonight a Saturday night face. 
Kind of that face that, that kind of minimalizes the, the problems we're dealing with and the sins that plague us. And so we, we carry these cards, but we keep them close because we don't want others to see them. And we actually don't want God to see them either. We want to pretend that we're not really holding cards in our lives. Sometimes there are things that maybe you did against another person that you wish you could take back. Sometimes maybe it's something you said. Sometimes there's things that you just don't even want to look at yourself. And so we keep a poker face. We keep a, a Saturday night face trying to pretend that nothing's really wrong, that we don't really have any problems, that we don't have any sin to hide. And we get used to carrying around these cards. And they become heavier and heavier because they're always with us. Because you see, these cards are our sins. And King David had that same problem where he wanted to kind of keep his cards close to his vest. You didn't want to talk to God about it. You see, we don't want people to know what's going on in our lives because, well, that would, that would be embarrassing. And that's why so many of us curate or edit what we put on social media because we only want to present the cards that we think others would like of us. Because the sad truth is, is that we think that if others really knew what was going on in our lives, maybe they wouldn't love us as much as they do right now. And so we wear that Sunday face. We wear that Saturday night face and we hold those cards and we don't let anybody get a glimpse of them. And we just hang on to them. And we find ourselves getting exhausted holding the cards. In Psalm 32 tonight, David talks about the sheer exhaustion of trying to hold on to those cards and keep them from God. He says, and you can see it up there on the screen, he says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as of the heat of the summer. I don't think God's hand got any heavier on David. I just think God's comforting hand felt heavy on David when he wouldn't confess his sin. And, and David just kept holding on, and he realized that it was too much to handle. So in verse 5, finally, he says, But then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I, I did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. See, David was, he was holding these cards so close, and he says his heat, his, his joy was like, you know, being out in the desert, was sapped up. Finally, it occurred to him that David could do something with his cards. He didn't have to hold them so close, but David could lay them down at the foot of the cross. He could lay them down with the God who would send the Savior Jesus Christ, and that God would forgive his sins. That God would, would wash him away and allow him to be made anew again. And so David finally showed his cards to God. And the funny thing is, is God already knew his cards. But God offered him forgiveness. Because God didn't want David to have to hold those cards that long. And God doesn't want you to have to hold your cards either. Because they've all been laid down at the table of the cross. Where our Savior has taken care of them. And so God just asks us to confess those sins. Not on social media. Not necessarily to our best friends. But to Him. To the one who can make a difference. To the one who can change the rent, the rat of where our sins really are. And so this idea of confession is just so core for, for us to be able to purge our soul from the guilt that we hold. And we do it so that a God that loves us might wash us clean. So confession is the first part. It's laying our cards at the table of God. 
But as a wise man, Martin Luther, once said, confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive forgiveness from our God. And so I'd like to just kind of close here with image two. Remember, image one was a poker hand. Image two is a fully restored classic car. Because that's how I see God working in our lives when we confess our sins to him. And as you think about restoring a car, one of the first things you have to do is remove the impurities, don't you? You have to grind away the rust. You have to, if it was in like the bottom of a crick, you have to hose it down with a fire hose, right? Sometimes you've got to sandblast it. You have to get rid of any impurity that will make it decay again because you can't restore a car and leave the rust there. I mean, just look at my truck. I tried to spray paint over it. It comes right back through. It's a great example of that. All right? I should really be talking about restoration, should I? But that's a fact. If you want to do it right, you have to get rid of the impurities. You have to cleanse it first. You have to get rid of that which decays and causes deterioration. And that's what God does in our lives. Listen to the language of David there. He says, wash away all my iniquities. Blot out my transgressions. Cleanse me with hyssop. That is the language of God forgiving him, but God removing the impurities that were in David's heart. And as God removes those impurities, that restoration process begins to take place and to take shape. And so that's the first thing that, that God's good news does for us. It, it removes the impurities of our sin. But then secondly, when you restore a classic car, you need to fabricate the missing parts. Inevitably, when you get that car there, you're going to go, we don't have that part. What are we going to do? We can't, we can't find a 1956 you know, Chevy part. Well, then we're going to have to make it. We're going to have to fabricate it. And fabrication, not lying, but although making things up, that's what it means to create and to make new. And so there might be parts that are missing that have to be made up in the body shop or, or maybe bondo that has to be put to the body so that it has structural integrity. God does the same thing with us. Having received forgiveness, removed our impurities, God then fabricates what's missing in our lives. And listen to what David said was missing in his life. He says, God, create a pure heart in me. God, renew a right spirit within me. You see, David understood that he didn't have a clean heart. I mean, at best, there were times in his lives where, where he had a heart desiring God's heart. But he also knew how his heart could fail him and be deceitful. And as of most recently, and what this psalm is talking about, he remembers how his heart was all about trying to hook up with Bathsheba, who was not his wife. David didn't have a steadfast spirit all the time. David's spirit was to, to desire carnal pleasure while other kings went off and fought for him. And so David needed something that he didn't have that only God could give him. He needed what was missing, and that was a clean heart. And that was a renewed spirit from our God. And so God removes the impurities when he forgives us. He puts inside of us what we are lacking and missing that he only can supply. And then you have that restoration process completed. Where you see the final product where it is restored better than original. In Psalm 32, David talked about his strength being sapped up. His bones wasting away. And he said, that was all because I held on to my sin, back to the poker hand. But here we see at the end of the psalm that God gives David something special. God grants David a willing spirit to sustain him. God grants him the joy of his salvation. Now track this. David said he had no strength because he was hanging on to sin. And here we hear that God gives him joy. Well, all you got to do is go to Nehemiah to learn that the joy of the Lord is our strength. God gave David strength so that he could be better than he was. And God does the same thing for us, too, as he gives us his Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to give us that joy of our salvation. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but he's with us, protecting us, 
guiding us, guarding us. I kind of think the, the Holy Spirit in this metaphor is like a clear coat over the paint, right? Beautifying us, making us sparkle, protecting us, and sustaining us from the elements that we park on. That's what God does for you, and that's what he does for me. And so as we wrap, we don't have to hold on to our sin as David was doing. Because once David turned it over to God, he experienced that full restoration of a God who loves him. We can experience the same God who manifests himself in our Savior Jesus Christ to prove that love and forgiveness where there upon the cross we see that we have been washed from all the impurities of our sin, where they have been blasted from us that cause decay, where we can see the Holy Spirit creating a pure heart and a steadfast spirit, and we continue to be restored in a strength which empowers us to celebrate the joy of our salvation. So as you leave here tonight, may your Saturday night face be a face of relief and confidence of a God who hears your confession and who offers you his free forgiveness, righteousness, and restoration. Amen. Now may this peace of our God, which surpasses our hearts and minds, keep us in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.